You don't need it. Good evening. We're going to go ahead and call our meeting to order. We've got 6 o'clock and uh, a busy agenda, so glad you folks could join us tonight. And um, we're going to turn it over to our superintendent, Dr. Right. Howard. Thank you so much, Ms. Wheeler. I want to send a very special thank you to our board and to our staff members that are here, and even those that are not here. We had probably one of the best kickoff starts to the school year that I can remember. We had a great, great first day, and now we're here at day five, and it's um, it's been a really, really great start. So I, I send a shout out to our operations team, our everything from technology to transportation, and our facilities look great, good open houses, and of course, what's happening in the classrooms is teaching and learning and remarkable experiences. So thanks to everybody for your support. And we have talked many times about the fact that our summers get shorter, Mr. Chronic. I don't know if you noticed, but our, mm -hmm. our summers get <laughs> <laughs> We go with that August 15th start date. <laughs> so it, it is a lot for our schools to turn around, and, but they've done a fantastic job. So we have a stacked agenda, so I'm not going to say a whole lot more, but a very special thank you. Just a reminder uh, that Monday evening's board meeting will be at South Jackson Elementary School at 630. They're looking forward to hosting us there and um, they always have a, um, a highlight as you know and they are, they're prepared. We have we have asked our schools um, to, to limit that to about five to eight minutes so we'll we'll have other highlights as well but the, the school highlights will be about five to eight minutes so we'll look forward to that. Just to, I just wanted to preload a little bit the fact that our next work session which will be September 5th will be at Gordon Street Center. And at that work session immediately following will be our first parent advisory council. So I've attached there for your review the parents who we have asked to be a part of that. I've spoken to most of them. I have not been able to get in touch with every single one of them, but I, I feel very certain that those, those folks will be there. At the bottom, you will see four people who are at large. And those folks, um, the way we've done the parent advisory council is the principals recommend two parents from their school. And if we have someone who has rolled off. In other words, their children are no longer in that school. We've removed them. But there are several that have been with us for a while. Um, Mandy Byers, uh, who's been with us for a while. She's no longer at East Middle, but I feel like we need her to stay. She's been a great at-large member since we started it, um, as well as Amy Soto. And you'll, you'll see the, the names on there. So there. We hope that those folks will stay with us and they can just, they have the history of the of the council and can help guide the folks that we have brought on new. And I've put a tentative agenda in there for your review. If there are any items that the board would like to review um, with, our, with our council, this is your board, but I know that, uh, or your council, we probably want to at least review for them the purpose of the Parent Advisory Council and the, and the, allow them to review our strategic plan goals. We won't spend a lot of time on that. And then set up a process for uh, getting their feedback. So you can review that, but <clears throat> just a reminder. The other reminder that's there that's important, um, we've coordinated with Mr. Kevin Poe, the county manager, and secured September 30th through October 1st, and I'm looking forward to that. I have a high hopes for that meeting with our Board of Commissioners. There, As our growth comes, there are more and more things we're partnering on and are going to need to partner on, so that'll be a great opportunity <coughs> for us. Uh, and then the board meeting schedule is in there. Just a reminder for our board that we intentionally planned the entire cycle for a year in advance so that folks are able to plan around it. And if there's something that comes up as an emergency, certainly we understand. But um, as often as possible, if we can have our board here, a lot is happening in Jackson County. We're, we're growing. We've got uh, lots of not new initiatives, but a lot going on with the planning for Empower as well as our new high school and renovations and so we want to make sure folks are staying informed so um, being present and being able to be here is really important we would appreciate you putting that on your refrigerator or wherever it's helpful for you so you can plan for it and understand things come up but and the next section which is the most exciting part of the evening every night, right, Todd? <laughs> we committed, since we have new members, to a policy review. And this month, we're slated for Section I, which is our instructional policies. And before I turn it over to Todd, I just want to remind the, uh, the board, primarily our new board members, that Jackson County Schools is a strategic waiver school system, which means that we have waived many of the Title 20 requirements. The purpose of that is to create flexibility and to allow us to do what we feel is best for our students. Therefore, 10 years ago, you would have looked at our Section I in policy and you would have seen a whole lot more policies because we put a policy to everything. We've really reduced that and we defer to state policy and unless it is something 
something we've waived. So if you'll look under policy review strategic waiver, um, there is a link there that says Exhibit B, flexibility, and these are the actual Title 20, um, t the what's the term I'm looking for, the guidance, I guess, the guidelines, the, the rules, right, thank you. These are the rules that we've actually waived. So you can see there the state board rule as well as the uh, Georgia code. Um, and because these are waived, we no longer have a policy for those. So with that being said, we have six policies. And Todd and his team are going to kind of walk us through making sure that our board is familiar with what our six Section I policies are. So Todd, sure. if I could turn The only thing I would add is just because we waived those, our, our mantra has always been we have not waived common sense. So Absolutely. It, it, it allows us to have the flexibility. But easy. We, we still follow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I wonder. <laughs> it still allows us to to have that flexibility, but um, we follow the state board rules. It's just that uh, we had a lot of procedures and policies prior to this as well, so we keep our procedures and procedures and keep our policies for policies. So as Dr. Howard mentioned, we have six. What I'm going to ask us to do this evening is there's the, the big one is actually IHF 6, which is a graduation. So I'm going to ask all of the teams, you're sitting next to your partner, for all of us to look at that and then go through and see if there's any suggested revisions. You will notice, though, that we have already done some of the work for you. And that one will be... It's the second, pay, uh, third, third paper clip. Third if we could all look at that one, it is the longest. And then afterwards, I've got one policy. They're going to be short, simple, sweet, and then I'll, I'll assign one individual policy to each partner pair. So let's take a few minutes, if you don't mind, looking at this and seeing if there's any revisions or questions that you might have. <coughs> And I, if I could mention, too, while you're there, Todd mentioned waiving state rules. There, mm -hmm. We are not allowed to waive anything under IDEA, so there are, there's federal guidance that we have not waived. And so you'll see GAA and many things in here that reference that, and th those are not items that can be, can be waived. <clears throat> Todd, the other thing, um, GPS is still throughout here. Do we need to do a seek and replace for Georgia standards? Yes. Yeah, Georgia standards of excellence that we'll need to, that's a...
Yeah, the ones that we've revised. Yeah, we've we've replaced it, but yeah. We also have SLOs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That needs to be. They all have AP and IB. Is that the only section that does that? Thank you. Don't want me to read. That's a good. That's a great point. So that. You want to talk through it now? Sure. Yeah. I mean, this one's pretty dense. Um, good. The biggest, the biggest changes that we made is you let us have to do with um, JRO, TC, and, and, and PE. Martha and I have had several conversations leading up to this meeting even about yeah. the, um, the the credit requirements for, for grade placements. And we're, I mean, everything other than the things that folks mentioned like GPS, GSC, I mean, there's a lot of guidance that we receive from the state. So um, that's the reason why we also don't waive this because you know, we have all that guidance right. from the state. Yeah requirements and we want kids to graduate so that they can go off to uh, two or four year colleges. Feedback, questions, thoughts, anything that stands out for the, your reading? Yes. Um, the only um, course that mentions AP and IB is science. By flipping pages, it's page four under the course of areas of study. So I think it's just that last sentence from science that probably needs to be dupl duplicated in the, well, actually, it's, I'm not, it's five. So we need to include the IB. There's just a, yeah, there's a statement there that says any AP slash IB science course may be substituted for appropriate courses listed above, and um, that same goes for social studies. And, so we do have the IB listed mm -hmm. on mathematics. Right. Other, we can make that. Other yeah, that's easy. Back. That's good. Mm -hmm. All right. Unless you have any additional questions, the the other uh, policies that the way I've divided this is, if uh, Mr. Chronic and his partner will look at competitive, competitive interscholastic activities. Ms. Wheeler and Dr. Howard, if you will look at the internet acceptable use. That was a topic of conversation today at the media uh, specialist meeting. And Ms. Anglin, if you'll look at media programs. And since Don and Mr. Clarcy is not here, Bo, if you and your partner, which I believe is Dr. Blankenship, if you'll look at both the very short, the gender equity in sports and school ceremonies and opportunities. I'll tell you that uh, other than the, the acceptable use, we've not made any changes to any of these in, in a while. Uh, yes, yours is no good for that IDE3. Okay. Better than Yes, sir. Mm -hmm.
You can at any time you can pull an inventory to follow and so they they would do have to have their inventories like that. Mm -hmm. Are we to the point where you see, everyone else will have not read this and, and they are I hear a lot of the cut and dry issues before but um, maybe just a, a one sentence, two sentence max of what, what it was and then if you have changed let's spend more time talking about suggested changes but yeah, let's start on the last end of the table if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Opportunity um, to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America during the school day. And the school administration is responsible for ensuring that opportunity is afforded at the beginning of each day and that teachers within the school would receive notification of that procedure. So it's pretty straightforward. We don't have any recommendations. Very good. Perfect. Mr. Howell? Uh, we have the media programs which uh, talks about uh, committees that are formed and what those committees do and as far as seeing the needs and making sure requests, everything's handled for uh, I like that it's a unified media program. It used to be a library, of course, when it was the you know, media center, so it covers a vast break in it. Um, it talks about how the media centers operate. Any suggested revisions? And I think I wrote that one as well, too. Is that yes. Oh, if I stole it? I'm sorry. It's all right. It's all right. It's all right. No, you took it over. You, you, you did great. Yeah. No. It's okay. We also read the gender equity okay. in sports. Sorry. That's great. Right. You, know, you know a lot about the media program. <laughs> <laughs> um, and basically, that. Uh, that policy is talking about you know making sure that we have equitable opportunities um, for both genders and that um, we have a person named as the sports equity coordinator that that person's information contact information um, is shared annually with students and that they should investigate any complaint received by the local school system alleging non-compliance uh, with, with the Georgia Equity and Sports Act. Um, it, they should follow the grievance procedures that we have established as well. And then uh, there's a section in that policy about donations. And uh, basically when that we are allowed to receive donations um, and when athletic programs receive donations, that basically they need to follow the rules and procedures that we have established and that the superintendent 
or their designee establish criteria for the evaluation of offers and acceptance of donations to the athletic. Which follows nicely with all the safe school stuff that all of our employees are seeing. Any suggested revisions for those two? I just wanted to ask, I mean, I didn't realize that we had a sports equitable, equitable uh, coordinator, so may our, I ask who that is? Our ADs um, okay. serve as that. So. Okay. That, that's <clears throat> it's not a separate title mm -hmm. yeah. within their duties and One of their duties and responsibilities, yeah. Yeah. yes. Yeah. So Mr. Okay. Lindsay and Mr. Hayes both are responsible for that. They work together and submit it annually, the Title IX okay. report. Mm -hmm. Very good. Ms. Angman, did y'all have anything to add to Bo's very nice report on that? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, he's been an overachiever. You did okay. <laughs> I was going to say, he's just an overachiever tonight. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> Miss Anglin's not offended, are you? I heard he'd been looking forward to the policy review. I was. Yes, I was. yes. So you just got over Chomping at the bits. I really did. Yeah. <laughs> wait, until, wait until next month. You might want to read ahead on that. Yeah, no doubt. We get into student section. Jay is dense. Uh, Miss Wheeler, you got the, yours is pretty dense with the internet acceptable use. Did y'all have questions or, or uh, maybe give us a little brief overview? Uh, well, no, I, I don't have any questions about it. It was just talking about the... Uh, children's internet protection that we have to comply with and and we have to make sure that we educate our children as what is uh, appropriate behavior um, and and then we also have um, and chime in if I'm missing something else but we but students also have a, a form that they have to sign that they will and parents also that they will comply and also uh, the teachers have to complete a, a, a form saying that they have done their part in educating our students on what was appropriate and inappropriate. And it goes in great detail about what is appropriate and what is not appropriate. And I'll add that the, the, the verbiage today refers to digital citizenship. And so all of our media specialists were meeting today and they, they all have a plan. It, it varies from school to school, but once a month, students have access to go through the programs in terms of what it means to be a digital citizen and passwords and bullying yeah. and cyberbullying and all that kind of stuff. So that, that is in practice throughout our school system. Todd, not to point out anything, because I take full responsibility for this, but I, I, I noticed on page two, reasonable public notice, we have, it says a new a public meeting for comment and review of our internet safety policy. We've posted that in years past, and we send it home with first day papers, but we don't really, I don't think we hold a public meeting. So we might want to either revise that or put that on one of our board agendas that annually we um, review that, because it, it is a big part of what we do. So we, that's a revision consideration. And again, like I said, that's something that just need to look at. Would we, that be something we need to talk about too at Parent Advisory? I was thinking that Parent Advisory might be might a good, be a good place time. because um, mm -hmm. honestly technology is a is a critical Big piece, piece mm -hmm. of it, it came up last year in some of our conversations I think. Well and as we, we've got more of our schools going one to one. We right. Yeah. Yeah. Understanding. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. Computers yep. So. Mm -hmm. good. Thank you. And last but not least, Mr. Connick, Mr. Gilbert. Go ahead, Ken. You might get a little more worried than me. Oh, sir. Hours aside, requirements about competitive athletics in the schools, both middle and high school. And in, in essence, it really says the principal is responsible to, for oversight of their schools. And then it talks about middle schools and high schools being subject to the state board rule, as, as many of these are. Um, we looked up the state book board rule. It's a four-page document, and uh, so we are subject to that and do it in accordance with state rules. Other than that, it says in middle schools that there's also potentially local school regulation and requirements that they have to meet. Other than that, it's straightforward, and we don't have any comments. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Okay. Well, thank you all for your input and feedback. We'll make those changes. Thank you, Mr. Nicholson. Uh, just on that interscholastic, just as an update for our new board members, at the middle school level, mostly sixth graders don't participate in most of our competitive sports. Anything that is full contact, they do not. We don't have middle school students competing in full contact sports until seventh grade. They can participate in things like golf and cross country and things that are individualized, but just for your... And that, again, is a local decision, and that's something that our coaches feel pretty strongly about developmentally. So. And we do offer rec programs up through the sixth grade, and that was a coordinated effort between the two 
the two groups. So you've got the Exhibit B for the flexibility. There are many other things. Um, if you have any questions that after you've reviewed some of those other um, rules that we've waived and how we manage that, we're happy to talk about any of those. It would take us the rest of the evening to talk about all of them, um, but they're there for your reference, and we're happy to discuss any of them if you'd like. So. All right, the last item under my, my discussion topics, which is very, very brief, and that is, as we discussed already, we've decided to have our board work sessions here and we've rotated our board meetings. And I just want to make sure, um, since we do have a, a, a new group on our board this year, we've planned our board meetings for the rest of this year, but you all evaluate whether that is convenient for you or if you would like for us to start working on a permanent location for board meetings instead of rotating to schools. Um, that, that's something that we just want to hear back from you. It was a part of our strategic plan. It was something that you all committed to. And it's much more convenient for you to go to one location each time, but you've made the commitment to visiting schools. Is that something we want to continue, or is that something we want to reevaluate? And we don't have to make that decision tonight. I just wanted to re remind you that that's something for consideration next year as we yeah. plan for the FY21 school year. I think it's been a good experience for us to be in the schools mm -hmm. and um, and really learn a little bit more about each one of the schools and what's going on there. Okay. I know that's extra work probably for the administrators there and the, well, you and well. the educators, but it, but it provides opportunities for those young people to share what they're learning and what they've done, so it's always exciting. To Great. Okay. Get, and, and that's my opinion. I, I agree, agree with you. I just, you know, sometimes it does put extra work on administrators and getting students yeah. and all, but yeah. I think it, it definitely took up our, where we used to have that two day that we tried to get around to all of them. Right and walk through, uh, you know, I enjoy it. Okay, yeah. good. Well, yeah. that's, I just wanted to, we just hadn't even asked about that. That wants to be a burden on that staff yeah. there either. Mm -mm. No, I think that they, I think they like it to be yeah. honest. And well, I think parents are more likely to come and interact exactly. with you. And that's why exactly. we done it, because nobody yeah. ever came. That's right. right. That's right. Good. You know. All right. Well, that's it. Yeah. That is quite simple, and I, we appreciate it very much because it does give parents greater access to be a part yeah. of what's going on. So. And y'all may have some other thoughts about it you want to share no, later or whatever. I think it gives children a time, a, a chance to be shining stars. Mm -hmm. Yes. Have yes. a real audience, that, too. That's important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in their own homeschool, mm -hmm. I think that's very important. Right. Okay. Show, their, show off. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, very good. Well, Mr. Nicholson, I'll turn it back over to you for leadership and um, updates, and we've got quite a bit to share there. We do, and since we do, I'm going to very quickly turn it over to Mr. Johnson, who has compiled a, a very thorough yet succinct overview of our milestones performance. So, Mr. Johnson. All right. So I'm just going to stand up for the first part. Just uh, There's a couple of different formats, and I know some people may not necessarily be familiar with looking at milestones data. What we tried to do when we compiled it this year is match it to a similar format to what the um, EA <coughs> has formatted, but to kind of lead us in, um, we've got a comparison chart, and if you look on uh, your left side, you've got third through eighth grade. Uh, most of these students take the end of grade or the EOG test as we commonly refer to it. Uh, the one exception being we do in eighth grade allow some of our advanced content students, they participate in the end of course test, um, which is the EOC. Now for a while, you may have had children or grandchildren that actually had to take both. So it was almost a penalty if you were in that advanced content because you had to take the end of grade test for the middle school content and the end of course test. So those kids are being double tested. So that was one of the state's very first looks at exploring some flexibility and saying kids only have to take one. And uh, for our students, that, that definitely helped uh, those advanced content students. What you can see in green, any place that we're green, we're above the state. And I included how much we were above the state with that plus sign. So for example, if you look in third grade English art, language arts, we were above the state in third grade on that assessment by 4%. That is one common question I know parents like to ask, and as a principal, we get asked, where are we in relative comparison to the state? In our elementary schools, in literacy and mathematics, you can see we are above the state in many places well above the state. Um, in those two areas. In science and social studies, we did notice a slight decline. And in the past, we have historically been um, well above in those areas. 
We know that part of that can be attributed to the fact that we have brought out a lot of English language arts reading and math resources. And a lot of our professional learning over the last year and two years has been dedicated to those resources. Um, we also started noticing this last year, if you remember Mr. Nicholson through teaching and learning had also um, talked about the need for prioritization of a science full-time position. So we went from Ms. Rodeberger, who did an outstanding job for many, many years supporting our schools. Um, and through her efforts, we were able to get some access to some National Science Foundation funds and grants that unfortunately have gone away, not due to her efforts, but at the national level, they've reprioritized those funds and resources. So uh, we now have Dr. Peacock, who's joined us, who has a, a very deep understanding of science and science content has worked uh, at our local RISA and at some of our other local school systems. And uh, he's already hit the ground running and working with those and then with social studies, working with those teachers and prioritized planning over this past summer. Um, so we knew this going in, there were, there were potential areas and, and we saw that in the data as it, it came out. Obviously, as you look up here, seventh and eighth grade, um, eighth grade is a primary concern. What we do know is our students that are taking it we only have one Dr. Warwick, unfortunately, and she can only be in one place at one time, but we have not been utilizing math for science. Um, they have been realigning it. Um, it did well with some of the national standards, but Georgia, uh, like many other states, has the flexibility and added a couple of standards, so, but they've actually realigned a few things. So we actually, West Elementary reached out to us early in the summer and said they were interested in utilizing the math science portion. So we work with our math partners who have been great and they actually have given us seats to pilot for free of charge there. So they're gonna be utilizing with third, fourth, and fifth and see if we're able to get the same type of data and utilize it to focus and target instruction. Um, high school, um, they are well above the state in all of their areas. And um, we actually have some programs where we've gotten some preliminary data and looking and just doing some comparisons. Um, for example, we've got programs when I say they're ranked 10th in the state, uh, when you're looking at 400 and 500 schools or 400 or 200 some odd school districts, when they're scoring 12th and 14th out of those 400, um, for example, our economics program at Jackson County High School falls out into the top six percentile of students. We have other programs and grade bands within our county. And uh, we've got to compile a few more. It's a little bit of a challenge to be quite honest with the eighth grade cohort now that they combine yep. EOC and EOG. Mm -hmm. So um, we just want to go back and double check the numbers, but we hope to be able to share that with you as soon as our next work session. Uh, because we do have many celebrations, but we're not hiding anything. We've got some areas that we've got to focus on, middle schools and area of focus. Um, and just going through a couple of other pieces, I know reading was something that came up at one of our earlier parent advisory uh, meetings when we first met with our new board and our parents. Um, I'm happy to say in all but one grade level, our reading levels are well above the state. But before I show you that, what I want you to see, you see grade three for the county, grade three for Georgia. This number that you're seeing up above, that is how we did compared to that grade level last year. So third grade this year compared to third grade last year. So we're actually up two points over last year in third grade. Now, why do I point this out? If you've ever been around Mr. Nicholson now when we talk about data, the state tends to compare third grade of one year to the third grade of the prior year. Well, that's like comparing this year's Braves team to last year's Braves team. It's great if you have all the same players and they're all at the same level, but it's kind of like comparing apples and oranges. But when people say, well, why'd those scores go up or why'd they go down? We've got that uh, information up there. So you can just see, and across the board for the most part, we did see increases. We have a couple of places where we didn't. Now, in seventh grade, we're right there level with the state, 75% proficiency level, which is passing for the reading level. However, again, in eighth grade, um, their reading, when we look at all of our eighth graders completely and totally combined, we saw a four percent difference from last year 
And on top of that, just to point out, when we look at our advanced students compared to that cohort, they're above. So it's a similar trend, but something we've got to focus on, look at. Um, I know East High and West Jackson Middle School have got, <coughs> both got some uh, made plans. They identified this early on and they adjusted their schedule. They've got their ELC extended learning times and WIM group set up to focus on specific areas of need. Um, we put in leveled intervention uh, literacy packets and resources for teachers and had training. We're doing some retraining with our READ 180 teachers. So um, they've worked with some of our most needy readers in those grade levels. One last little piece of reading data to share. When you look at it and how it's shared at the state level, a lot of times they're going to show you last year's third grade, this year's third grade. All right. Well, we shared that with you in the last slide, but the other thing that's important to look at, we want to look at the third graders from two years ago and what happened to them over the time. So we actually saw a slight decline from third grade two years ago to when they took the test in spring. Now what we're doing with our schools is looking at those students and seeing how many of these are students that have been with us the whole time? How many of these are new students that transferred in? We know that we're growing and we're starting to get in more and more students. Historically, students that have been with us from kindergarten up through tend to do quite well. So is this a situation where we might need to have some additional targeting structures in place so that when we have students come in and transfer to identify some of those needs a little bit sooner on. Fourth to fifth, we actually had a substantial jump. We went from 63% students passing the reading portion uh, to 74%. Uh, we know that fifth grade is a gateway year for students going to middle school. And while it's not the only indicator, um, we know a lot of effort was placed on there through our schools and their MTSS school improvement processes to focus on there. Other area of need that popped up, fifth to sixth, um, any middle school principal or sixth grade teacher is going to tell you that transition. Anytime you move a kid from one kid school to another school, you can you can sometimes see an implementation and transition dip. So that's an area of focus. Our reading teachers from fifth grade and sixth grade started working on some things last year to address some of those transition needs. Um, and Ms. Godfrey is prioritizing our middle schools along with the language arts. We had a lot of celebrations, which we haven't seen this trend so much in the past. We actually saw some declines, but I'm very happy to report our sixth graders going to seventh, seventh going to eighth, and eighth going to ninth. We saw continual increases in their proficiency, um, and that's due to the hard work of those programs. We don't have it all uh, where we want it to be right now, but we're definitely seeing improvements. Um, I did get asked a little bit earlier, why didn't we have an era going from ninth to American Lit? American Lit is a very mixed class because we have 10th graders taking, 11th graders, and sometimes 12th graders. So you can't get a straight comparison year to year. Um, oh, jumped to the wrong computer. <laughs> I'm not going to run through all of these. Um, but what we've got for you just to kind of orient you. We've got third, fourth, and fifth grade language arts. All the rest of these slides are going to have a very similar format. Proficiency, and it's according to who you talk to, which I find <coughs> interesting. Some systems consider proficiency levels two, three, and four. Mm -hmm. um, we don't. We don't, and our principals won't. Uh, they're looking at levels three and four and how our students are doing. So from a state standpoint, you can see here, um, we're looking at about 42% of the state was proficient in English language arts, which I can talk about. There's an issue, a lot of issues there when only 42% of the state. Um, and you're going to see that trend in many areas. This is level one, level two. Level one, your beginning learner, what used to be considered failing on the old CRCT. That level two is developing again on the old CRCT version that was passed. Mm -hmm. So if you're thinking in frame of reference, when some of you may have been in school or your own younger children were younger to the CRCT, that red line would have been the old passing line, essentially. 
What we want to see, we want to see our green lines going beneath this dashed line because that means we're outperforming the state, but we also want to look and see how do we do compared to ourselves last year. So that's what that number in green represents. So you will see in many of these uh, scenarios up here for third, fourth, and fifth that we actually saw gains over time and from the system level we saw gains. Um, in our schools where you'll see some red above, like for example in Maisel, even though they're currently demonstrated a 30% proficiency on English language arts, they also increased by 9% over last year. That's huge. Um, and uh, in fourth grade, you can see a very similar trend. Uh, they're still significantly further behind from the rest of the state, but they're making gains and strides over the previous year. <clears throat> It came as a surprise because we showed it on that first overview slide. Sixth grade, we saw some very large gains, and which is unique. Usually we see more gains on reading than language arts, but um, our teachers have been very, very targeted on the language arts standards, and it shows as we see the increases in gains they've made. Um, we're going to have to go back and do some cross curriculum reading strategies, some good fashion. Absolutely. Know, and uh, looking at what our kids are reading and how often. Uh, seventh area of need for us to focus on. And then when we look at eight, we did make some strides. Each acts in the high school. They've got some things in place that they're focusing on and tweaking to address that. High school, first of all, I want to point out ninth grade lit and composition, not only is it taught to ninth graders, it's also taught to our advanced eighth grade students. So when you look over here at first, you may say, oh my gosh, they went down by 14%. When you look at how the state proficiency level is and where they are significantly well above, and they will tell you too at East Jackson and at East Jackson Middle School, they've been going out and they're encouraging some students that may not have typically been re recommended for some of these higher level courses and trying to get them in. And um, I know as a parent myself with my own child, I, I pushed her times and I said, you know, I'd rather you get a two or a 70 in an AP class and take a general class because that's going to help prepare you for a more rigorous opportunity but definitely um, opportunities to improve on in math we continue to see that same strong growth over time i do have to point out when you look at third grade here as a district we continue to increase seven percent over um Maysville. and all of our schools are doing amazing things but um when you look Maysville, the increase of 36 percent over last year um, another huge celebration um, they're 24th percentile in the state when you look out of one thousand there were 1243 schools that took third grade milestones last year so they're in the top 12 percent of that number excuse me 24 percent the only school that outperformed them in our district was East Jackson Elementary School. So I know typically a lot of times we've seen reports these last couple of years and Dr. Archibald will tell you, they're focusing on growth, achievements going to come. We're seeing it. Yeah. And they're seeing it in the hard numbers. So they're doing the right work. And the same work they're doing is the same work our other schools are doing. So, you know, we're seeing those dividends come through. Fourth grade, for those of y'all that have been with us and watched data for a long time, this slide hard. would have been all red last year. Yep. Mm -hmm. We actually have one of, we will see a lot of growth when the CCRPI comes out much later in the year, October, November, December, whenever the state gets it uh, together for us, we should see a lot of growth mm -hmm. and uh, our schools will as well. Grade five, um, we, we've got some work to do. Mm -hmm. As a district, um, we saw a little bit of a slide over last year. We're still above the state, but there's a lot of room for improvement. And uh, many of our schools, in talking with their principals, they'll tell you we've been. Many of these schools have had a strong literacy focus, mm -hmm. and we're, we're just going to have to balance out those areas of support. And the milestones, uh, looking at math for sixth grade again. You know, we've not always seen this. Sixth grade mm -hmm. sometimes been a struggle in these areas. Growth, seventh grade, eighth grade again. Yeah, we've got some areas to work on. High school, as a district, we went down 1% point over 
last year. However, still look at where we are performing. And if you'll notice, for example, at East Jackson High School, eighth grade, only 3% of those advanced learners, uh, those are eighth, grade, eighth graders taking that ninth grade high school level course, getting toward the proficient level. Um, West Jackson Middle School, similar thing. They did encourage more students to take that test, and typically they had offered more advanced math classes uh, with high school credit, and they're going back and looking at that criteria that they use to make sure that they've got those students not only prepared, but also ready to perform at that level of work. Geometry, as a system, we continue to increase. Um, East Jackson High School, uh, and Jackson County High School, both as far as their performance. We should see East Jackson come out around in the top 12% of the state. When I called Ms. Palmer to tell her that, um, she said, our people aren't going to be happy with that. They were higher last year. And I said, I understand. But I said, you know, that's still kudos and hard work. We're talking about a different set of kids year over year. Science is near focus. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we mentioned that earlier, and you can see it, it shows out in our data. Um, it is worth mentioning at East Jackson Elementary School uh, for science and also social studies. Where other, other schools saw some dips, they didn't. Um, and Miss Halley uh, and their team will tell you very honestly the year prior to that, uh, and Miss Pennington, they had, I believe, four, if not five, new fifth grade teachers at their school. Uh, and they poured a lot of support resources within our department there at the school level and it paid off a year later. Physical science, we saw an increase um, year over year and we saw some, uh, some strong increases with our high school programs, 9 through 12. Uh, with our 8th grade programs, we saw a little bit of dip in what we've traditionally seen. Uh, they're still significantly well above the state, but they're not pleased with that level of result, and they've already started working on uh, over the summer uh, focusing on those areas. Biology numbers, we as a system do show down, but there's something to mention within here within East Jackson High School. Um, that's very uncharacteristic for them. The year before last, they actually reformatted their program. So they only had two groups of advanced biology classes being taught last year. So this uh, next set of data that is compared to is when they have everybody back in. So when they used to have all ninth graders take biology, they changed that two years ago and they only had two honors advanced groups. And then, so it's a year later. So basically you're comparing extremely high performing kids to small classes of that to their entire student body taking biology. Um, so that's part of the reason for the skew, but you know, Numbers are numbers. Uh, social studies, as far as grades go, East Jackson Elementary <coughs> is one of our highlights in South Jackson. Um, South Jackson, Ms. Brookshire will tell you, she and her team, that they weren't pleased with our overall performance. They've got a lot of areas to grow in. Social studies was one of those areas where they did outperform in the state and saw some growth year over year. Uh, in terms of West Jackson Middle School, when they get all the retesting and everything done from the rest of the state and they haven't released final numbers, we anticipate they'll be in the top 10% of the state. Um, they actually saw a, a large increase. Again, um, East High has actually started working and they've got some teachers that have been doing some data teams already to identify uh, focus areas and also some student support pieces to help those students. High school. We've got a point of pride here. Uh, U.S. history last year when we were looking at data and our print, neither one of our principals were very happy with how their U.S. history data uh, what a, turned out. They ended up with an 8% increase overall for the district. And then Jackson King High School um, saw one of their highest performances in the last five years, um, up by 13%. And then in economics, um, one of the few places in the state we saw them actually have a little bit of a dip and decline. We went up by 4%. Um, both of our high schools did extremely well when you look relatively to the state. And we actually, um, at Jackson County High School, they do, it, both of our high schools offer economics in the fall and the spring because it's a half credit course and they do EOCs. It's worth mentioning that at Jackson County High School, they were 
their data is going to probably put them in the top 6% of the state when you look at students in that proficiency level. Um, so um, kudos, our high schools, the overall trend, we saw increases in every area. Um, overall as a district. You now, some of our individual schools may have some little areas where they dip down a little bit. Uh, elementary, science and social studies are our main area of focus. Uh, and then middle school, we've got to look at that seventh to eighth grade and uh, pin some things down right there. So, yeah. But uh, please let me know if y'all have any questions. Uh, I, when I was talking with some teachers earlier today and they said, what are you doing? I said, I'm gonna go share old data. <laughs> um, because we're already got teachers that are chomping at the bit to start with math testing next week. Because um, the data that we got to share with you today, remember, was started back in mid April. April. <laughs> April yeah. um, so the data that they'll start using math for next week, if they give it on Monday, they'll have it on Tuesday to start working with their students. And Martha, being the magician, she has actually um, figured out a way so that teachers when they before they even started school could go in and see all of their spring data for their students so they could start grouping kids already based on strengths and areas of focus. Can I ask you a question? Uh -huh. I'm sorry I have a no, it's okay. time. We like it. No, it's that's good. good. It means you're listening, engaged. So so why is economics so good tax count? Why why that one program? And and the broader question is how do we then weave that in with everything else? Great question. Um, and Mr. Nicholson, feel free to step in if, if I miss a portion of part of that. Jackson County High School's program and in both of their programs, the teachers have the opportunity and we get them together for planning during the summer, so prior to the start of the school year. Um, Jesse Wood, uh, who's one of our teachers at East Jackson High School, is actually helping to facilitate our social studies teachers. So they had U.S. history teachers coming in for uh, two days along with economics teachers and our teachers that are brand new to the system. And they were sharing best practices. And it's literally when I say they're competitive with each other, but not at the point of cutthroat. So it's one of those things when I say like, okay, but you're outperforming me in this standard on uh, cost and cost analysis. What are you doing? And, how, and, and so forth. Um, you know, we, we as principals are, are that same way. We want everybody to be successful. Uh, and when someone wins, we all win, but we're also going to go and say, what are you doing? Sure. Show me your secret. And uh, I can't think of any place in our system where somebody's not saying, I'm willing to share this, or this is what you can do to get better. Uh, I want to pipe in there if you don't mind too. We, we, there's been a consistent economics team there, and so when you have when you have an opportunity to teach with the same folks for several years, and you've got some folks that have been doing it very well for a while, when you have turnover, that's you talk about teacher retention. It's really important, and it's not that those folks aren't probably fantastic, the new folks, but it takes it takes so a little time. Team at East High. That's right. The geometry team at East High has been together, been yeah. and they are they were number one in the state year before last for growth. Yeah. Number one in and like number two and number three for growth in mm -hmm. the state. So, um, and are they, you know, I'm sure they are, but they're recognized on the school level. And oh, oh, gosh, yeah. yes. <laughs> Donuts in the morning. car <laughs> <laughs> service that takes them Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's one of the first classrooms I visited yeah. on day one. <laughs> yeah. Well, and yep. that's why, um, I'll be honest, having worked primarily more so with elementary and middle, over the last year, I don't want to leave anybody out and just name names, but I know that they they share back and forth all the time. And the same for our middle and elementary schools. We arrange classroom visits back and forth. It used to be that I'd say, hey, why don't you go see so-and-so? Now our principals, they just pick up the phone and say, hey. I need to send somebody. <laughs> and, and we don't have to wait to the end of the year with the map in elementary and now middle. And one thing I didn't share, and I don't know if you were going to be able to share, um, our high schools are going to be piloting. so. Jackson County High School, for example, has volunteered they are wanting to utilize 9th, 10th, and 11th grade with their English language arts. So um, they've got some new staff members that they've hired that have utilized math in their old uh, school system, and they want to come and show. So we've actually, Martha, myself, and Jennifer Sane, who worked at the high school um, in a media MRS capacity before joining us now as a personalized learning coordinator, is going to help lead those efforts. Eighth grade at East High right now, they're really wanting to refocus on how they're using MAP, uh, and then their plan then after that is then to look at moving it up, or, but they want to make sure they know eighth grade's a, a performance focus for them, and they, they don't want to overstretch, and I think it's smart. You, you start with your biggest area of need and work out. 
Let me go back to your original question. For those of the board, the two board members that have been here, when I used to do these presentations before we had, had Troy, we would say we want to see green. And there were some years where we just didn't see as much green. So when you saw the green that you saw, I mean, so it, that's, econ is a great example, geometry is a great example, but really the work that we're doing with our teachers, the content support that we had through Dr. Ward, Canadian Godfrey, and Dr. Peacock, and going away from generalists at the district level, really having people that own content that are true practitioners to be able to sit there and roll up their sleeves and, and work with the teachers, I think is, you'll start to see that, I mean, A, more and more green, but more and more examples of, of the, you know, they pointed out econ. I think it's triangulation of the teamwork and the consistency that Dr. Howard mentioned. But our team is fine. There was a time when we didn't really have a team to put support. Mm -hmm. We just said, we're glad that good teachers stuck around. Yeah. Now we're really delighted that good teachers stuck around, but we're also equally excited that, that good teachers want to be here and that we have the resources and the time to, to pour into those teachers. So Absolutely. I'm pretty confident Absolutely. that this trend is, is now going in the direction. Yeah. It's always been going that way, but the rate at which it's going that yeah. way is, is yeah. certainly at a faster pace than in the past. Can I ask a quick question? I'm, I'm new at this. No, oh, you're not. But um, <laughs> not teaching. No, I was going to say. <laughs> Lord, no, I'm old forever. Um, those that are teaching college courses, what, what are the requirements as far as training and um, what, what all does that consist of? For our dual enrollment courses specifically? Yes. So we, we have a couple of different situations. At UNG, we have UNG instructors that, that teach those courses, so we don't get to choose those, those instructors. They're adjunct with, uh, so they, they have their whole set of criteria that they have to go through to be professors, essentially. Uh, then we do have the flexibility that with our Lanier Tech partnership, they will allow us to have our teachers become trained so that they can teach those, those courses we haven't which, done that yet. Was that? We haven't been able to do that yet, yet. <laughs> but it's... But, but the, the idea behind that is because, because I, I'm probably interpreting some. We have some, some, some areas of success, but we also have fun now that when kids get into these dual enrollment courses and they're not actually ready for the college experience. Similarly, our university professors are not ready all the time to be working with, they're still high school students. Mm -hmm. And so we, we have, we just met not too long ago, actually, with uh, Mr. Eastler and Mr. Schultz and Dr. Howard and myself, and we were listening to our, some of our high school counselors about that very point of contention of how do we bridge that? How do we find, uh, and we're supposed to go have like a college and career counselor from both of our, our post-secondary partnerships, and we do, but they're not housed here. And that's, again, that kind of goes, goes into our vision for Empower because we want our kids to be successful in dual enrollment and we really would like as many of our teachers to be credentialed to teach those courses. Um, so I can't really answer it specifically because the two the two institutions have their own uh, requirements. Right. But they but, but they but, are trained. They I mean, are they trained. trained yeah. I mean, they, in those areas. Yeah you you've got I mean it's just like going to you know being a professor at UGA I and mean, they all have their, their criteria with degrees uh, the number of hours within their content and the experience. I think the biggest thing is that they're, they're just not used to teaching 17 year olds. Yeah. For, high, for high school teachers to be able to teach uh, core content, generally they have to have a master's degree or above, plus 18 hours of in content study. That can't be education related in content study. It has to be specifically sure. in content mm -hmm. study for the core academic classes. Of course, when you come to the technical, requirements there's uh, different requirements for those but uh, you know my intention is we if we move and power forward and we need to hire instructors is to try to find some of those instructors who have the qualifications necessary to be able to teach dual enrollment and uh, your high school courses so. um, sorry any other questions for the board? Well, I'd just like to say that there's many celebrations. Uh, certainly, we'll always have areas to work mm -hmm. on, but I'm delighted to see as much green as we're seeing. Yeah, I am too. <laughs> yeah. Anytime you have children, you're going to have areas to that's work right. on. That's right. That's right. That's right. We'll to always have all something all to work on. Yeah. 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 So, so, but we appreciate all the teachers and the uh, administrators that are in the trenches every day doing the hard work too, and all the support that they're receiving now. Thankful for that now. Absolutely, and, and you, 
the ones in the trenches are doing the hardest work. They so absolutely, we're here without to serve a doubt. And support, but they're the yeah. ones. They own all the success stories. We'll own the stories that are as mm -hmm. bright and shiny as we can be. Um, with your permission and, and just time permitting, I'm going to segue us into the next topic. Um, and that is, if you'll open up the GMAP update, I, I want to just give you a, a brief scenario of where we are. Remember, that's where we're in the pilot. We, we submitted to the uh, U.S., or actually to the uh, state DOE, and then state DOE then submitted to the U.S. Department of Education. We've been approved. I think I, I shared that. And what we, where we are now, then what this document does for you, if you get any questions about it, it's kind of nice because we're, we're still doing what's called map growth, and that's what Troy mentioned too next week. The 12 people can administer the map data, and they can get that data the next day, and they can use that to personalize instruction. So map growth continues, but if you scroll down, Amanda, that's background information just for your, your uh, reference. There is a, a, this column shows you the difference between map growth and through year, but if you'll just keep going down on one that's, kind of, that's got the timeline, perfect. Uh, I just wanted you to know where we are in this. Map growth is exactly what we already do. It's we give that in the fall, the winter, and the spring. It's, it allows us to make predictions. Troy will tell you that those predictions are very accurate. When we presented the data earlier, what's really great about this is there are no surprises. I mean, if, if it's not as good as we want it, it still wasn't a surprise, but, but it, we, we know, and we've been working towards that all year long as opposed to getting the data and then saying, what are we gonna do about it now that we have a whole different yeah. set of kids? Yeah. Uh, but that what this timeline shows you is, is actually year one was 1819, and the way that we wrote our proposal was that, that year one was, if you're not already given that birth, you need to be doing it. We're already doing that, and you have to also give the milestones, because ultimately what we have to show is comparability, that, that we can get the same, the same data, we can make this, the same assumptions, we can report out to the state for accountability purposes, everything that they need, but not use milestones and use maps. So while Mr. Johnson shared all this with the milestones, that is the state's required assist, uh, assessment system. What we're looking at is replacing the milestones with map for a whole host of reasons. Uh, the fact that it allows us that, that in-time data that we really can then figure out where student strengths are, where their weaknesses are, and target that instruction. How about in August instead of, you know, like I said, the year after. So year two was this pat was was this current year, um, uh, and so what we're looking at is you'll see that we're still doing map growth. We're still giving the milestones. You'll see something there that says ELA Math and Science. As Mr. Johnson mentioned, we're going to pilot science at West Elementary. Even if we if science if we don't end up loving it, that doesn't knock us out of map. What it would mean is that we would continue to have to give the science milestone. Uh, ultimately though, if we, we can work with our, if we've got uh, Dr. Peacock's on the content advisory board, and as, as we can work to make sure that we, we like those questions and they're as accurate as predictors as the ELA and, and math are right now, then we would certainly want to replace that. But what you can see is is next year, where it says in the middle, there's, there's a little uh, dotted line, year three, it says through year, as soon as next year, we have to go through what's called a technical advisory committee where this, we've got a team of analysts and, and, and they're, they're data experts from all over the country and they will basically pick apart the states, not, not to be rude or mean, but they'll look through and they'll make sure that, that everything we're saying we're going to do is going to provide the metrics that this US, I mean, the State Department of Education needs. And so they will grill our team, they will, they'll have us go back and do revisions. We have a wonderful, wonderful uh, team of folks throughout the, the state, actually, that are, are going to be representing um, along with us. And I feel pretty confident that, that, that that'll, that we'll, we'll survive that and we'll actually have a stronger, better program, which means that potentially as soon as next year, we would start with what's called a three-year assessment. Our teachers, for the most part, students aren't going to see a whole lot different, but what that allows us to do is for that year, we can collect milestone data and we can collect map data, or actually this now the through year data. And if we can show that comparability, then what we can start doing, as you can see there, is we can start phasing out milestones. We will still have to collect it for a couple years, but we don't have to collect it with all students. We can decide maybe third grade is still going to take just the math portion, and maybe fifth grade is going to take um, just just, um, you know, just science, as I mentioned. Uh, we still have to, we just have to make sure that we have subpopulations still collecting that data we're already giving both of them right now so it doesn't yeah. it doesn't it's not additional assessment the nice thing is we can actually when we're successful just reduce the amount yeah. of assessment mm -hmm. and it gives kids multiple chances 
The beautiful thing that I love about this is if a child demonstrates proficiency in August, then they don't have to Keep get retested really mm -hmm. on that again. They, yeah. And they, nor should they have the same experience as another child yeah. who didn't demonstrate that proficiency. Yeah. So when we talk about personalization, you really have to figure out what to do with that because mm -hmm. he came in and he knows half of the math standards. Well, let's make sure that we don't just say, well, you're gonna you're gonna just sit. And our teachers don't do this, by the way. But it it it, it gives us the ability to empower our teachers to really do that because. Ted's not going to take the exact same test as everybody else is going to take because yeah. he's already demonstrated that efficiency. Yeah. Yeah. So I wanted to I wanted y'all to know where we are on this. We'll continue to keep you updated. This was the, the most recent uh, update. And once we go through the technical advisory committee, we'll let you know how that uh, how it came out. Yeah. I actually heard something on the news just recently talking about, of course, they didn't <laughs> name the school systems. Yeah. But I mean, how many are there of us that are in this group that are <clears throat> now? Now there are all sorts of folks that want to. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're joining on now. If, 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 hold me. Yeah, I think there were eight initially, with yeah. thirteen total that, and I can't remember what they want, what they called them. There, there are eight that wanted to be in the consortium, and there were some others that were watching us. They're associated. I could get you mm -hmm. the specific name. Uh, but now we have folks that I think it was Harrelson County that said, mm -hmm. no, the child would do that. Clark County is looking. Mm -hmm. and, and so the DOE, though, is, is refining a process. If you were, if you indicated when we applied that you were you wanted to be an associated partner, then you can come on board. But if you didn't indicate that, you can't just jump on the. Mm -hmm. on the okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Which I think makes sense. I mean, sure. Mm -hmm. Sure it does. Yeah. yeah. The yeah. five affiliates, they can join affiliates. Yeah. 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 That's what it was. So yeah, yeah there's a, they're going to have to go through some steps. Awesome. Yeah, I kept waiting for them to say Jackson County is one of the school systems. They didn't mention us. Yeah. They didn't. They didn't mention anybody. But anyway, it was sort of exciting to hear that. Mr. Nixon. Yes, so, so the more we grab onto the map test, the more our classroom are going to have to evolve as well. Right? Oh, absolutely. Our instructional strategies, processes, without a doubt. But it also gives, in my mind, when you still know that you have the test hanging out at the end of the year, right. you, you, we, we've got to shift our mindset. It, like I used Ted as an example, if, if he doesn't need that support because he's already right, he can move on. If he's in fourth grade, he's demonstrated sixth grade, seventh grade math proficiency, then let's let him experience that. Okay. And, let's, yeah. and that, that is the, the vision of personalization. And just so people know, it's still aligned to the state standards. Absolutely. We can't get away from that. We're not advocating, but it's no longer. It's, it's a higher not, standard because you're expected standard. to move kids constantly instead yes. of annually. <laughs> you're, you're measuring a child's performance against themselves, not right. against a standard. Yeah. That's right. And they still have to master those standards, but when and how quickly? It's yep. up to them yeah. and their teacher. So, so who over, who's in the schools that oversees that is that the principal? Or are you guys going to schools the, with the shift in? We, the, it is embedded into everything. So with that strategic plan, that the holy cow, parents, <laughs> it is in everything we do. It is our theme this year. Stay the course, teaching, learning was our uh, leadership thing, but it was personalizing your journey. And so we we feel like we do a really good job of providing quality academic experiences. And power is not the only way that we're preparing for the future, but it's it's really the the. the the epicenter of what that's going to look like, but personalizing learning is our major goal, not just for this year. We have some, some teachers that get it, they're doing a wonderful job with it. We've got other teachers that want to learn more about it, and, and ultimately this, it'll be the expectation that, that everyone feels comfortable and understands what that looks like. Because uh, it's, it's, it's not easy. It's harder. It's, mm -hmm. it is. it's harder. You don't teachers. write one lesson plan and teach right. the same thing. That's right. right. Um, it's that's... what's right for our kids mm -hmm. over time. So. Well, and to give you a, an example, when our math teachers got together and worked over the summer with our math leadership team and Dr. Ward, they looked at the writ bands, because that, which I think you're familiar with. So when they looked at it, they wrote examples that went along for the each standard, and then they went out and either searched for or made or in the process of creating. So any teacher, not just third grade I go find third grade examples they have now on our personalized learning for teachers their portal page they can go there and say hey I've got a kid that's uh, at a 240 writ band and I got a kid that's at a 130 writ band which is about five grade levels difference and it happens in our classrooms for this particular standard and they can go there and find resources for it so it's not like I'm on an island by myself they're now building that repository and 
in the old days, we'd have the file folder down the hall mm -hmm. that everybody shared with. Well, now it's electronic. And you know what? We had a teacher the other day at the middle school that was looking at a kid's um, writ score of brand new teacher. And she said, you know what? I teach sixth grade, but this kid's operating at about a fourth, fifth grade level with this skill. Instead of saying, what do I do? They said, Dr. Warwick showed me a resource I can go to and pull it and said, look, here's a resource. They can still learn the content, but it's going to have language and vocabulary that's at their operating level. It's not that they're going to give up on getting them to sixth grade level. It's just they're giving them an access point where they are. Wow. Thank you, guys. I'm excited about that, so I appreciate it. We are too, guys. <laughs> Thank you. And, and again, any questions? A lot of data we, we uh, just shared with them, but we, we're here every day. <laughs> uh, uh, again, packed agenda, so unless there are any other questions, I believe it is now Mr. Eastwater's turn to give us any more update. Just a real quick update on what we've been doing, and it's just, to me, it's really hard to believe that it's been 30 days. It feels like it's been a week, but things are moving pretty fast, and, and really, we've uh, the work that I've been doing is centered on understanding the work that took place uh, prior to me coming on board and what those expectations are, and then building the foundation of what is going to exceed the student learning experience when we open and power up. So we had a great meeting up at Lanier Tech with our uh, secondary design team uh, planning. I'm probably going to find a better name for that at some point <laughs> in time, but uh, that's what we're calling them right now, uh, where we got to tour Lanier Tech's facility and get some great ideas of things that we might want to do here in our own facility. Um, we've been reviewing architecture, uh, architecture uh, proposals for the redesign of the, the building and really looking forward to moving forward to that so that we can get a concept of what that might look like because uh, I've also developed a proposal for a capital fundraising um, campaign. Uh, the, the community has been great in its support and its passing of the, the a bond referendum and all that's gone on, but there's still a lot that needs to happen. And so a very, very aggressive uh, capital fundraising proposal that campaign that uh, when we get that a little bit more solidified, I'll probably share that with you because we can always use your help in raising funds for uh, for the Empower and, and, and not just one time things, ongoing um, uh, operational funds that can help us really provide those experiences for our students. Um, I've in the process of building a skeleton of what Empower might look like uh, and very excited about that because now we're putting the real um, putting the pieces together of, of the student experience, uh, the programs and, and how we'll be offering the programs, uh, how we're going to increase dual enrollment opportunities for our students and, and strengthen the partnerships with University of North Georgia and Lanier Tech and all those different kind of things. So a lot of intricacies involved in that. We're going to uh, definitely engage the uh, design team in those processes. but. Uh, taking a, a nice, strong proposal to them that we can start working on and working out the details. Um, and then finally, the, the last piece that we've talked about is how can we serve uh, the middle school uh, program? And uh, there'll be a lot more details coming with that, but uh, really kind of landing on a 6-8 uh, academy model that'll be different than any that the other two uh, schools are, are dealing with. And, probably serving anywhere from 300 to 400 students on an application basis, but you'll get a lot more detail about that. Uh, and uh, it's gonna be a great experience because then it will expose a significant number of our middle school students who can go through the program, get excited about it. It'll be a great feeder program for uh, the Empower Center, but also just for really hopefully transforming uh, education across all of our classrooms, across uh, going back to your question, doing things differently uh, for our students. So um, that's really pretty much it. A lot going on. He's, he's been a busy man. <laughs> been very busy. Exciting. Very it is exciting. very exciting. It yes, is very it is. exciting. Very exciting. He's got a, as you know, he has a uh, the equivalent of a board. Uh, his his uh, Empower board met Tuesday, and he gave them lots of updates. And he's got a lot of community support on around that table. So it's exciting. All right. So now, I believe we're Todd. transitioning to Mr. Schultz. With, yeah. Uh, CTA Perkins. And well, and one of the things, um, Reverend Moon, I said too. Every year, we're required because we have federal funds through Perkins to actually get your approval that we're using the funds correctly. So it's, we're mandated, we have to put it on our contact list, it's all these things too. One of the things, you know, we all, sometimes people get misunderstandings of how we're actually funded in that stuff, but we do get Perkins funds, which are federal funds, 
and then we have our local funds. And the local funds is all QBE. And when you're when we get our QBE for our CTA teachers, we're at 1.1868 your <laughs> QBE, okay? A regular class, that's called K weight. A regular class, like English, math, whatever, they get D weight, which is one. So we actually get a little extra funding, and that extra funding is for our labs that we're getting. That's really for our supplies, really helping to maintain our programs and all that. And supplanting is something we always hear with federal and things like that. So we have to kind of watch them. Anna keeps me in, so does Aaron, and all those help me, and all this. We got a great team. Um, some things that happen a little bit too, and, and if you look on the sheet, this is an actual allotment sheet that you get from the state, and this is FY20. Um, you know, we have right now, we have eighth graders that are taking high school courses. Um, those eighth graders are taking it in our high school classes with the labs and everything, so we're still paying for a lot of that supplies and that stuff. They actually only get 1.1347, so I mean, they don't even make as much FT. So, I mean, Martha and I, we've even talked to the state, I know Martha has really talked to the state even more, but about, you know, why aren't our eighth graders that are in our high school actually getting the actual K weight when they're doing their classes in the lab, they're using our high school teachers and everything. I commend the school system because it's allowing kids to actually go forward. Um, it's something that we've decided it's what's best for the kids. Um, and so I, I commend them for doing that too. But um, to kind of, and I highlighted it on there, but if you're looking at CTAE, um, of course we get our FTEs at 381, we get our salary that goes with our teachers. The state actually gives 125, 44 in operating expenses. So we get a good chunk of operating expenses coming to our system. Um, right now we're getting about 65,000 for our actual program. So about half of that stays in the system. It does help pay for different things. Um, the one thing too, I mean, in terms of, it shows the teachers of what we actually earn in terms of FTE is 19.05. And right now we're at 18, so we're actually under. And when you're thinking about the teachers too, those are just high school teachers. All middle school CTA teachers are actually funded through the middle school program. So we don't, we don't get that extra CTA funding when those teachers get the middle school. Again, it helps them, it's the best thing for those kids and everything like that. A lot of people don't understand that our FT that we generate, we actually like 0.85 of a point. We always hear points that are actually pays for a counselor. So you know, CTA does actually help pay for a counselor. Um, actually, even DOE has put counselors under CTA. They're not considered a CTA teacher, but a lot of their professional development, some of those other things, counselors are in there, and I've enjoyed working with some of those teachers and stuff. Mike is happy to we even get a tech spec um, as 0.35. So I mean, we actually generate some extra funding going towards some of those, and that's something I don't know a lot of people even know that that happens. So I just kind of wanted to show you, I mean, like right now, we're at about 18 high school and we got six middle school teachers. Um, so again, just some info, info that you, you see these, and that's just the state allotment sheet for FY20 and that, but for, Purposes of approving the budget and that stuff, um, we're getting right now about $58,377 from Perkins. Um, and what we do is we put those funds for professional, um, not professional development, also um, program improvement. We can't really pay for consumables out of federal money. Um, the consumables, those are actually our funds that we, we come from our system. And we're required by federal law to match whatever federal dollars comes from Perkins. So, and we do that, we do match and we, we definitely been like that all the time. Another thing that we do generate to, it's called Perkins Plus, but it's actually $20,000 that we use for students gaining um, national assessments from their end of pathway assessments. These are assessments that any person, if we wanted to take those assessments, we'd have to pay uh, to do that. And we do that for our students, which is a great, and we'll kind of talk a little bit about later on. Um, another thing we get from Perkins, I guess, it goes to professional development. It's a consortium of all the CTA, um, all the 
okay. counties. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't do Sorry. that. <laughs> but all the counties across the state of Georgia all put some money in a consortium, and it pays for what they call the CTAERA, <laughs> which is, is a CTAE resource network. And that is actually a professional <laughs> development network that pays. So our, our teachers don't have to pay to go to these professional development opportunities. Um, the CTRN actually pays for the people to come and get their professional development. We have to pay for travel, but it's a great resource for our CTA teachers and also for our um, counselors. Um, actually, I was talking to some counselors just the other day. Some new teacher, new counselors are going to be going to a professional development to help them look at some of the new things they want to do. So, again, we're about a little over eighty-three thousand dollars from Perkins. Which, on the grand scheme of, I know um, when you're talking title, that's probably not a whole lot, but uh, it's still a, a big um, help to our program. Um, in terms of how we figure our funding, again, for our Perkins and SF, we use what we call core indicators. And this is something you'll hear, and that's really how the state makes sure that you're doing the things that you're supposed to be doing with your federal dollars. Um, and it's pretty exciting. And I'll be honest, the past two years, I've been very excited um, because we have met every single one of our core indicators from for federal purpose, which is great. Um, and when you're going through there, I know we, we still have areas to work in terms of language arts and math and things like that. One of the things that it actually uses in terms of core indicators, it uses CTAE concentrators. And there's two different types of CTA students. There's a participant and then there's a concentrator. Um, a participant is a kid just trying a class out. So they take one CTA class um, and it could be something they just kind of put them in there or whatever. You know. A concentrator is one that actually finishes a pathway. So they take three consecutive courses and they finish a pathway. So a lot of our core indicators are really focusing towards those students that are doing pathways. Um, and, and usually those are the ones that really are excited about what they're doing too because they're really gaining more and more knowledge as you get in there. There's some, um, looking at the data and that stuff, you can see it is exciting. We are way above the state on all of our core indicators. Um, in reading and language arts, you can look in the, the dark blue. Uh, we got a target, we blow our targets away. The state's in the red. Um, if you look at mathematics, again, what I love about um, you know both language arts and mathematics, sometimes we're not trying to put just all English in in our CTA classes, but yet they're recognizing that they are doing English in CTA classes. Um, like we're talking about doing stuff, lexiles is one of the things we were always talking about um, reading. They actually have said most of the manuals that are in some of our CTA courses are actually some of the highest lexile reading that a student can actually look read. Mm -hmm. So if we can teach students, they may not want to read Shakespeare, but they could probably break an engine apart reading a manual on expertise level. Um, and then also on the math, uh, it was neat to see some of the things like in Mr. Gilman's um, ag mechanics class, he had different boards in there were doing measurements. And I mean, they literally, it was applied math and kids understand I mean, sometimes they'll say, oh, I can do that easily, and I, and I don't do algebra. You know, so they're doing it. They just don't know it. But um, those are two. I, I'm very excited about our teachers. We have worked hard trying to um, incorporate that with our, our teachers, too, and it's showing. Um, the technical skill attainment, this is EOPAs, and that's end of pathway assessments. Um, after a student finishes the three classes in the pathway, they actually are, have the teachers work at the very beginning. They actually look at certain national assessments, and a student can take that assessment for national recognition. Um, some of them, I'll be honest, some of the EOPAs are not as good as the others. I mean, but especially when you're looking at like healthcare, um, some of those are some of the best ones you could ever be. We've got CNAs. We've got, um, one of the things is this. Clinical medical assistant when students can actually receive that. Um, we had students that actually went in and did the um, exercise physiology, um, where they actually would become a, a, a national exercise um, specialist. I guess you're saying some of these exams are over two hundred dollars per exam, and I mean some go down to twelve dollars. 
So, um, you know, but yet, again, the teachers are really trying hard to make sure that the students have those credentials to be able to go on. Some students that they'll actually, where they receive certain levels of like attendance or their actual grade point average and different things like that, there are different criteria for them to take. Um, we have some that we're trying brand new ones and, and it changes because it is, these are national tests, so it's a, a constant deal. Our teachers cannot <clears throat> take the test. Um, they cannot read the test. I mean, these are all things that, I mean, it's, they're really trying to shoot for what they call, um, and they look at the criteria and do their best to make sure they prepare them and that stuff. But um, the exciting thing is, I mean, we're at 66.5 last year. Um, I guess that's one we didn't go above the state, but I think some of our students were actually taking higher levels than most of the state were taking too. Um, and you said that now we're paying for those. We pay for all the of those students tests. don't have to do. Our parents they don't have to have do that, to do anything. which um, is so wonderful. Like I said, we, we're, we've got twenty thousand dollars that we mm -hmm. use to pay towards all those students, and we actually any of the students that pass those, they actually had cords, and mm -hmm. I was very excited. I think even at, at East last year, they had all the kids stand up that passed mm -hmm. it, and it made me excited because I mean those kids worked hard oh, yeah. to do those, so um, it's pretty neat. It's, and we'll look, you can look at the last day and we'll look at that. I mean, both of our schools were very even on um, how many students passed those in fact with us. And on the very last, if you scroll up all the way, you can see some of that, um, the data, if you want to look at it, of what kids actually passed. We had 442 students take the tests and um, 280 of them passed this past year. So we had we were over to about 60, 63%, but we did have, we tried four new assessments last year. And, um, but we're, we're still working on it. I wish we could pick some of the tests because some of the areas aren't quite as good as the others, but we're, we can only use the exams that the state says. So, um, some very exciting, and one that makes me almost, you know, elated when you think about it, is the diploma and the graduation rate. Um, we've got a very good graduation rate for our, our school, period. You know, I mean, that's wonderful. Um, and again, these are looking at kids that have taken three courses in a row. The kids that have, are the concentrators actually receiving a diploma, again, for the second year in a row, 100% of our students get that a diploma. Wow. So that's pretty exciting. Um, on the other hand, too, when you're looking at the students that have graduated um, and, you know, those students, and we're at, the state was 63, or excuse me, 96.3%. Six, we're at 98.1%. Um, last year it was 98.5. But those are kids that have taken three courses in a row that are graduating from our schools, which is amazing, you know. Yeah. So um, that's exciting. And also what was exciting was secondary placement. These are kids that are going out of our programs that have taken three courses, they're either going to post-secondary college, they're going to a technical college, I mean, it could be a four technical college or going straight to a job or into the military. Um, last year we were 100%, we're at 98.88% now. So I mean, it could have been one student or just something, something there, but those numbers are very exciting. Um, we're trying to make sure that we always focus our funds to students and um, our teachers are doing a great job and, and we're really excited about it so that's great if there's any questions i, I try to run through it quick but um, thank you that's great thank you. exciting absolutely exciting news. all so right that that's it. <laughs> <laughs> y'all hanging. <laughs> Gee whiz, that's it. My star's above. Y'all are falling down on your job, aren't you? Just an hour and a half, Mr. Nicholson. Good job. <laughs> Who's keeping score tonight? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, I have one more teaching and learning item, um, just as a reminder. <laughs> um, the um, 
Jackson County Conference of High School is going to have their official IB International Baccalaureate visit, visit on October 24th and 25th. Dr. Michelle Golden is the IB coordinator, and she has asked if there are a couple of board members who would be willing and available to give her a couple of conversations because one of the things that the IB team will want to hear from are some a couple of board members who actually say that, okay, we, we do support this program. So um, you all think about that, and if, if you'll let me know, Dr. Golden's delightful and very informed, and she just wants to make sure that you have the appropriate information so that when the team comes that they can speak to you. So um, if y'all think about that. With that being said, Dr. Blankenship, ready, set, go. <laughs> I got ribbed last month for speaking for 45 minutes. But, you know, July is kind of my month. <laughs> <laughs> okay. They can't so, do that. They can't well, do that. It's, it's teaching yeah. and learning. That's so right. I'm That's not right. going to be as long with okay? Um, I do want to share with you our enrollment numbers. And so you've got some attachments there that I, I'm sure you have taken a look at. Um, and I'll just kind of highlight a couple of things. So the first page in the uh, enrollment overview uh, attachment that you have um, there's there's two pages and the first page is that enrollment um, monthly enrollment update that we give you every month and so we've started that out um, and I want to thank Martha and, and Teresa and their team for helping us gather these numbers and making sure that they're as accurate as they can possibly be um, we have our August 2nd which was our first day um, of school our enrollment totals and then August 7th, which was yesterday, um, our enrollment total. So you, you see that they've stayed pretty, um, pretty consistent there. And then in September, we'll come back with our, our end of August um, numbers for you. Um, same format that we used last year. Um, on the next page, um, I want to thank Martha for putting these numbers together because it kind of gives you a, a, a picture um, Across. So you see our, our FY19 ending enrollment there was 79.52. Um, she's also added in, just for your information, what our, our summer withdrawals were, um, the number of new enrollees that we have had, and then again our August 2nd enrollment and our August 7th enrollment. We've also included our actual physical uh, count from August 7th, as you know, every year we do a five-day um, enrollment and then we look at it again at the 10th day too. And that helps us to see what students um, have, are not showing up at all. And so the only thing I would say about that uh, number, it is a couple of hundred less than what you see the enrollment. That doesn't mean that those are the same students that are absent every day. So you have some students that are absent one day, but they're back the next day. And so, um, so I, I would caution you to see that as a picture of, oh, as a system, we've got 220 students that haven't shown up at all. That's not necessarily the case. Um, and we'll look at that over the next uh, few days, and we're continuing to withdraw students as we get those withdrawal requests. And enroll. And enroll <laughs> as we get. They are still doing. Um, the next attachment that I would want you to look at is the. Um, so, because we are, if you look back over the last three school years, we've averaged a, an increase of 280 students uh, every year. So, first year it was uh, two, 17, 18, it was 300. 18, 19, it was 250. This year is, is around 300 again so far. And um, so they're still coming in the door. So mm -hmm. I, I, would, I think we're gonna, we always see another surge around Labor Day. Yeah. And so I kind of expect that we'll be close to 8,400 um, yeah. around that time, possibly. So, mm -hmm. um, so because of that, we are also monitoring our down to the class, classroom and grade level. Um, on a daily basis of what those numbers are looking like in our classrooms. We have um, two areas of need, by the way, and, and that is at North Jackson and West Jackson Elementary. Particularly first grade at North Jackson and third grade at West Jackson Elementary. And those numbers are just much higher than we, we want to see um, at our 
at, at those grade levels in terms of class size and, and student teacher ratio. So what you have here is an executive summary um, that outlines the need for those two additional positions. And so I, we put this in here for your consideration. I'll give you a little background um, just about how staffing is allocated. And so when we, it, it's based on historical FTE data and just as a uh, little primer for, for our new board members, they look at the past three FTE cycles. So um, we've got an example in here that I'll show you in a minute that, that will help you to see what I mean. So that, those full-time equivalent counts determine the basis for our funding from the state. They don't account for any increase uh, throughout the school year. And even when, when we get to the next school year, that's averaged in with, the, with two other FTE counts. Does that make sense? So it's, it's looking back and it's historical. So we're always sort of playing this catch-up game with what we're funded. And we do sometimes get a midterm adjustment based on our, our FTE. If there's a, a significant increase, then, then sometimes we'll get a midterm adjustment that helps us. Um, and that was the case in uh, last year mm -hmm. when we added the two positions at North Jackson because of the increase in enrollment there. Uh, if you recall, we came to you in September and asked for that. We were able to, to give us those positions, and then we received a midterm adjustment uh, because we were able to continue earning funding through a reduced class size and just the, the increase in enrollment. So, um, to, just to highlight some of these, uh, it does allow us to maintain the class sizes that fall within the, the parameters that we've established as a district and it allows us to continue to maximize um, state funding. So if you look over at the, uh, the last attachment, you're gonna see that same uh, state allocation sheet uh, that Mr. Schultz showed you earlier, but we've highlighted for you uh, for you to see what we, our, our funding number for FTE was 77.27. And as you recall, that, that's about 200 less than we actually had. And we could spend probably three days, you know, talking about how FTE is determined. There's different scheduling and different da, da, da. Mm -hmm. um, some some programs earn more, some less. But uh, I want you to scroll down because down at the bottom you'll see an example of a school so what that first one is the district allotment sheet and so what Anna does when she receives that district allotment sheet she then has to determine okay so how do we split this up and so she has a, a calculation sheet that she uses that then distributes the FTE earnings down to the school level based on the, the students that they have the program needs that are at that school and so forth. And so the last sheet of that attachment shows you an example, and we've used West Jackson Elementary School here because it is one of the schools that we have, are, are requesting an additional position. And so you can see the note at the top there. It says uh, the West Jackson Elementary School initial staffing allocation is based on 883 FTE. Their actual enrollment though is well over a thousand. I think 1,025 as of today. So you can see why we would have a need for additional mm -hmm. teachers. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. there. Do you have any questions about that? I know, uh, and, and Anna, please, if I misspoke or, or not uh, added any de details that need to be added, please. Are, are we to the plus on teachers from last year, or how many more teachers do we have this year? We've earned 26 more. We've earned? But we, on the books, how many do we have? Yep. On the books, how many more do we have? Yes. About 30. And that doesn't have to be answered now. I mean, are yeah, we, we can get that to you. I can, I can present. We're on the plus side of that. We, oh, yeah, we've we actually, y'all have supported more than what we actually increased in earnings. Yes. Yeah. But I knew with some leaving. Right. Everybody's been. We're net positive. Yeah. 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 We replaced all the ones that left, but 
We also earned 26 additional from what we earned last year. So all of those have been filled. But then as, as um, information came in, initial enrollment numbers, special ed needs, um, we also requested some additional positions that, that you supported through the tentative budget to, to hire and fill those positions. All right. when, when did they do that? When is that? October and March. March. Okay. Mm -hmm. So will we, since we are going to be, you know, even over our projected, we're over 300 students over our projected mm -hmm. students. So then are we going to be able to not do or say, we need this much more? Or? Well, in October, they'll do, they'll do another FTE count, but but the allotment sheet that you saw up there, that that FTE number is actually based on a weight between the last three FTE counts. Okay. And so there's big calculation that they use and a different weight on each one of the FTEs. So we're always gonna be behind as far as what they fund us and what our actual FTE natural enrollment is at the time. The, the, they never give us the number that we need. Right. You know, mm -hmm. we get we get bare bones and then we just have to Make, make up the rest. Right. But then yeah. they do. Unfortunately, we're in a position we can do that now. Right. Right. When we were not at other times. So. And because you all have done that, we have been able to maintain the, the integrity of our instructional sure. program. I mean, that sure. really, we're very grateful uh, to be blessed and also yes. have a very supportive board because that. You know, when when systems are in that position where they're not financially able to do it, or their board doesn't support um, the needs that are there, that's when the children suffer. That's but exactly also, right. too, those are cases where you, you lose, lose funding, funding uh, because yeah. you get to a certain class size and and you no longer earn some of the program earnings. Mm -hmm. And so, that's the position that we're in in both of these schools as well. Not yeah. only is the class size well above what we established that uh, we would also we're also in uh, jeopardy of, of not earning uh, the maximum funding that we yeah would. yeah yeah and we also lose good teachers if we're not able no to, doubt you know, no doubt mm -hmm. and then take care of this the so so we would ask that you consider uh, supporting the addition of these two positions. So that's there. And I'm happy to, if you think of any questions you know, between now and Monday, uh, I'm available. And of course, Dr. Gower is always available. Um, we do have, uh, have a request at, uh, at one of our elementary schools at Maysville. They, they have um, a, a pair pro for every kindergarten class, just like all of the other schools do. Um, one of their pair of pros is they fund through um, with Title I funds, and but it's not a full time position, mm -hmm. and and they would really uh, think it would be a benefit to them if they could have a little bit additional funding so that they could make that position full time full position. Time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. it's five and a half hours now, and they're they're just asking for enough to make it. Um, I know, yeah, yeah. So both of those items will be on the agenda for Monday night mm -hmm. for the two new teachers and the yes. addition for yep. that. Okay. I do have one piece of good news that I'll wrap up with, um, and I believe that Dr. Howard is going to share the personnel recommendations. Yes, yes. In the executive session. But uh, the one piece of, you remember uh, we shared with you about Project SAVE and about how all of our schools had become Project SAVE certified in the end of last year. This is amazing. <laughs> It gives me chills. It does me too. So, so uh, Ms. Brewer, our lead nurse, shared with us. Actually, it was uh, Tamara. Tamara, Tamara Freeman, uh, mm -hmm. who is our, our nurse on the east side of the county, shared with us that we had a, a school who, uh, East Jackson Middle School, did a, a drill just the other day and they did a great job. But just two days later, they have a situation uh, at one of the games. A softball game. Uh, umpire or referee whatever they're yeah, the umpire softball <laughs> um, collapsed on the field and one of our project save uh, first responders was there from east middle oh and went goodness. out to the field and was able to start cpr they got him to the hospital and he survived well, that does give you cold chills. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah. And and this was a person who who, yes. who probably wouldn't have if it hadn't been yeah. for that right. quick response. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness! Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and yeah. I, I, is, is it okay if I share who? Oh, you're absolutely yeah. Stephanie, okay. Harrison. Stephanie Harrison. Stephanie mm -hmm. Harrison. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. so, she's a PE teacher at East Middle. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. she, she just did an incredible job of Terrence. That's great. She's very, very complimentary of her. And so yeah. we're, just, we're thankful that we have staff mm -hmm. who are willing to step up. And do that I just part, thank yeah. Stephanie for being willing to, mm -hmm. to take that on and, and to respond when it was needed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hope she'll be recognized for that outstanding. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. We'll call her to an upcoming meeting. I don't know if she's got a softball game Monday yeah, night, yeah. but we'll reach that, out that to her. That would be appropriate. I think that's great. There when they were doing that drill and they were all yes. excited because they did it they like did less it than two minutes. Than mm -hmm. done, you know, 20 seconds faster. Because I remember oh, there, because Kelly was there. I mean, there was neat. Mm -hmm. That's Mm -hmm. Yep. It matters. Those things matter. Uh -oh. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Blankenship. All right. We do have some exciting updates from the financial department. The long-awaited, um, we, we've got our regular monthly updates, but the long-awaited tax digest discussion, which I think is critically important. So Anna, share with us the good news. And of course, Aaron is here as well. And appreciate uh, Aaron's going to our schools as we, with our new leaders and spending a lot of time helping them make sure. And we're grateful for that as I've gotten great response spots on that to help them. But Anna, FOSS report looks good. Yes, FOSS report. Um, it's a little dip from last month, but year over year is great though. Yeah, but again, I mean, you're talking about people being on vacation mm -hmm. and, and, you know, in and out. So that's not a shock and it's very minimal. Um, but all other measurements, it's, it's above, you know, year over year and mm -hmm. above, our average is now above $650,000 for the 12 month average. Um, and so it's that this block activity is looking great. I mean, definitely a trend of being well over six hundred dollars, six hundred thousand mm dollars -hmm. every every month. Yeah, that's um, good. Amazing. And then we've got um, the general fund and our fund balance is still trending higher than, than what it has and uh, we're starting the year off at almost eleven million dollars. Are, are ending the first month of the year at almost $11 million and um, you know, two and a half million dollars above where we were this time last year. Mm -hmm. And um, so that continues to to be a sign that we will not, of course, have to have a tan. And, That's good. Um, yep. good, good, good. Yep. Absolutely. So everything, everything is just is moving right along where we want it to. And then uh, the regular financials, of course, our revenue is, is, is low mm -hmm. now because of it's not quite started getting our um, tax collections in and but where as far as expenditures are right where we're supposed to be at this time of the year eight percent and that's even with all the startup costs um license renewals you know beginning of the year purchases so, so everything's looking good excellent very good great news so um as we all know the um little bit later than normal and we were still very grateful to um alan Sargent and um our dear she's married now candace i want to say candace taylor but um so we've gotten some good information and anna has provided for you the both the five-year history and um some budget summary there so you want to talk through that a little bit and we can we basically by today don't have to have a recommendation because we need to have hearings and so forth but consideration for what we would like to do with the millage rate what you all would like to do with the military? Um, so right now, the five-year history has has the millage rate um, that we are currently levying, which is the eighteen point um, eight five eight. And on the budget summary analysis, I've given um, scenarios of that millage rate, a median rate, which is um, eighteen point six five four three four, I think. Um, and then the rollback rate, which is 18.423. And I mean, my recommendation is at this point is to, to leave it at the 18.858. Um, it's an extremely minimal, what they say, a tax increase. Um, but it's 2.19%. And so if you look at houses that, um, are an average cost of two hundred thousand to five hundred thousand. The difference in their annual tax bill is anywhere from thirty-two dollars to eighty-one dollars. So it, and that's only if their property actually got reassessed in value. Otherwise, if it didn't, then then your your tax bill would remain the same. same. Mm -hmm. The other consideration is that. Um, 
there was some speculation or concern that we may have to raise the bond millage, and we will, we not, will not raise not the bond millage. Anywhere That's in right. the near future, yeah. if yeah. we are, it's, with the increase in the, in the digest, we're easily going to be able to meet our, yep. um, our bond liability. payments. Mm -hmm. yep. Yep. So, any, so any, we would still have to have our hearings. We this, do. This would mm -hmm. be a, a little bit of yes. an increase. Okay. Right. Yes, because and unless we actually set it at the rollback rate, anything, yeah. any yeah. amount yeah. above, it's going to, yeah, it's going to, the rollback yeah. is going to require three years. Yes, yeah. 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 So you all. Um, Discuss that among yourselves. Consider it. Think through what you feel like the best consideration is. Uh, you've heard Anna's recommendation. I would second that. The, you all know the, the, the growth that's coming. And so, um, and, and I will say, I think it's important, we recognize the fact that we're running a much higher um, fund balance. And so, from a community perspective, there could be consideration for, well, if you have that kind of fund balance, why we're trying very hard to not have to take a tan. And it takes right. yes. it takes us having at least a $12.5 million fund balance now to be able to not take out a loan to make payroll from basically yeah. September through December. Mm -hmm. sure. So, and that's, um, and that's saving us some it's money. saving yeah. us. You know, it, it probably would be good for us to, when we're asked, to be able to share. How much of the savings it is for us well, not to have to. And well, it's, it's not it's just the interest savings on that ten. Our bond rating, the bond our rating, rating yeah, mm -hmm. has improved because it's of that. Because, because we have not had to take out yeah, a ten in yeah. so many years. Um, yeah. That was the reason. We have for sixty a couple of years. Yeah. That our rating actually declined somewhat. Sure. It's because we had to continually take out a ten yeah. even yeah. Yeah. to just. Yeah. operation costs. And so that was, premium that we were able to get on the bond was a direct result well, of us uh, having uh, to a solid a yeah. solid yeah. fund balance. Yeah. So yeah. instead yeah. of fifty million dollars, we're gonna have substantially more because of the premium and that's purely a result of sure. having a balance. So yeah. sure. um, it, but if it, we could sometimes get that information about what kind of savings that would be, mm -hmm. I think that would be good for us to be able to share with the public. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we'll look at what the interest cost is, which the interest cost is not near as much as as the benefit of okay. the sure, premium sure, on the bond. So I would consider I both. I, but I think they're both of Absolutely. Mm -hmm. We need to yep. make sure. Yep. Yes. Yes. You know, somebody may ask us that. Sure. I'm confused now. So, so we're going to need the no. No, 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 we're not. We're so not. Why, would, why would we say you're saving money if we're not? Well, if, if we don't have to borrow the money and pay interest, pay the interest on the money. that's what we're saving. Interest on ten million dollars. That's almost a little bit of double speak. If you're saying we need we need to raise your taxes so that you won't have to pay interest on loan that we need. Is that well, mine? technically, we're not increasing the millage rate. We're just leaving it leaving. where it is. It's just that because of reassessment and property value, right. it's the it's, way that it's, it's calculated. And it's going to be an increase. It's going to be an increase for anyone who's reassessed. Right. Yeah, but it's not an increase based off. Military. Yeah. Right. Does that make sense? It well, does, but it's still. Yeah, yeah, and it, it is. Going to see it as an increase. Well, and it is going to and be. And it is. You're, you're, it is going to be somewhat, sorry. but it's it's going to be minimum in comparison to what it's been mm -hmm. in the past too. Well, so. any, any but still, increase, any increase is an increase. Any increase you're is right. An increase. You're right. Especially. Yeah. 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 So. yeah. 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 But that's why we discuss it now, and your point is well taken, yeah. and we're, we, that, it's for discussion, and we'll have hearings, and you don't vote on the recommendation until after you've had, you, so, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so very, I mean, welcome, that's why you do that. So. Yeah, and of course, those will be well publicized so that anybody can come mm -hmm. and share their mm -hmm. concerns, uh, and, and we have in the past had people to come and, and share concerns with mm -hmm. us, yeah. you know, that we've taken into consideration. So, good question right. though, and great point. Yeah. <laughs> no, we appreciate it. We yeah. want that for sure. All right. So um, that that, however, is um, all we really have. Anna has shared with you, and we already have a schedule. Miss Bridgman has it that we'll be sending to the newspaper, our legal organ, to advertise the hearings. You have a copy of those hearing schedules. They're already established. We align them to already existing board work sessions. But as you know, we're required to have one morning meeting, so mm -hmm. that final meeting will be on September the 13th for the final budget uh, budget uh, hearing. So. Um, if you'll just make sure it's it's already on your annual calendar, but if you can just be, make sure that we have a quorum for that, that would be helpful. Meetings, these hearings will be based on on the recommended millage rate that that you that you mm -hmm. the that whole board voted on Monday yeah. night. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. It's, it, it's, yeah. If we go to the rollback rate, then we don't have we to don't have, have hearings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So we'll wait to hear from you tomorrow or Monday so that we know exactly what we're recommending and then the hearings will be aligned to that. But we have everything ready to go if you should go forth with maintaining it as it is. So. We do have to go ahead and get the, um, the five-year five history to the paper. So it will still indicate the 18.858 millage rate, but that's just, again, that's just comparative historical um, information for the taxpayers to see. It's not. It's not saying that this is what we are setting the millage rate at. Just information, chair. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. We're pushing eight o'clock, and we saved Todd. It's not the best for last, but we saved <laughs> uh, facilities and operations. You know what happens in our classrooms every day is critically important. We say our teachers are the most important people, and they are because they're the closest to our kids. But none of that happens without amazing very dedicated hard work from our operations team. So um, Ted and Josh and David and many, many others. Dr. Morris is here today. Thank you. And we've got several folks here. Technology team, um, talk to us a little bit about where we are with our facilities and projects and updates there. I will, and uh, we'll, we'll try to hold this to about 90 Minutes or so. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Sounds about right. Well, how kind of you? Maybe not. Yes. Maybe more like it. 89, Ted. Get it to 89. <laughs> uh, if you'll take a look first, we, uh, uh, we're at the point of we have two Georgia DOE capital outlay issues before you, and there's two <clears> supporting <throat> documents in the, in the first item. If you'll open up, um, you'll do the other one, Amanda. It says Georgia DOE at the top. And if you scroll down to the third page, this is our contract for the application that was last year. And it includes two projects. One is the new high school and one is East Jackson Middle School that comes up uh, this spring mm -hmm. commencement in May. Mm -hmm. So you can see if you look at the far right column that we're receiving 11.5 million approximately on the high school and close to 1.6 million from the state on the uh, middle school. So this is a contract. We uh, have this in it for Monday night as board approval. So if you approve that, we get the dollars. If you don't, uh, we won't get the dollars. So <laughs> it's very important. We need the dollars. Uh, if you, any, any questions on the contract, it follows the application that was made the year prior. Uh, so if you look at the other one, uh, you'll find this is our next application. And as Josh and I work with Deborah Robertson, our Georgia DOE facilities representative, we have four projects that we're putting into this application or asking your approval for. One is the East Jackson High School facility, and all of these are for HVAC work uh, that's needed in all of those. And what happens on the, with, with modifications in the mechanical system is after 10 years, we have eligibility. And we have need now. So East Jackson High Facility, West Jackson Elementary, East Jackson Elementary, and Maysville. The last three elementaries would, would uh, put in new air conditioning for the gyms. They're the last three in the district that don't have air conditioning. Mm -hmm. So this is a great need for us. But we also looked at, other than Maysville, we looked at East Jackson, West Jackson, and East Jackson High for uh, to do all of the HVAC work throughout the buildings. Uh, what I'll point you to is under eligible need in the second from kind of the middle, uh, you'll see that there's an eligible need of about 4.4 million that the state identifies. They won't give us everything or they won't put eligible need at the total cost, but that's what they give us. If they uh, use this 4.4 million. If you go over two columns to the right, you'll see the el el eligible state funds at 3.6 million. So to do uh, that work, our contribution in the far right column is 818,000. So it's a tremendous value for us to put in 818, they put in 3.6. Obviously the work, if you look at the final column is the architect's estimate. We still will combine this with SPOS dollars to complete these projects, but that's a tremendous uh, uh, position. We have talked about the elementary gymnasiums in the past. We've talked about East Jackson High, but as we met with Deborah and looked at this, it really made sense. Uh, and Josh really saw this as a need to go ahead and do the complete systems at West Elementary and East Elementary. So any questions on that? There's 
you'll see that's the first page. The second page basically says that uh, when the legislature approves funding, they always approve at some portion of a $300 million statewide um, funding. They then vote either 100%, 80%, 60%, or 40%. In our case, the numbers are the exact same in every one, so it won't make any difference. Uh, but this is really great news. It's good funding, and it's, and it's going to help us meet the needs. Okay. Any questions on Georgia DOE? Okay. So you have those documents, and they will be on Monday's meeting. Item number two is uh, we're going to talk in a couple of minutes about uh, instruction project delivery methods in terms of a board recommendation. We thought it might be helpful if we put in our own little internal summary that uh, in terms of what does a hard bid process look like, what does a construction management risk, and what does a design build like? You're very welcome. Uh, all of these are Georgia DOA approved. They're, they're all good. Uh, methods, the design bid build and the construction management at risk are the two that are seen more these days. Uh, some people do design build, but not quite as much. So this is just for your review. You can take a look and see how each one uh, affects all of these different categories on the far left. And then if you have any questions, please give me a call or Josh and we'll be glad to talk through uh, any questions you might have. We are recommending the construction management at risk for the two upcoming projects, East Jackson Middle and the uh, Empower College and Career Center. Uh, both of those are, uh, one being a, a big renovation, there's always risk, uh, unknown conditions in renovations. And then Empower is one that we're just beginning, as was, we talked about earlier, as John was sharing, uh, to put the foundations into this. So to try and decide early on that it ought to be hard bid when we don't really have a program and all the details, we need to work with not only an architect but a construction management firm to move through that process. And we have enough time mm -hmm. to do it. So it will be, we recommend that as the best process for both of these. So if you have questions again, you can certainly get in touch with us and we'll be glad to answer those. I will skip down to item four quickly. That is the recommendation, the executive summary uh, that recommends. Uh, whoops, I opened the wrong one. I'm sorry. Well, it's in, it's in the. Uh, pardon me, I was looking for it. I think I've got the same. The same. No, there it is. Uh, construction management at risk. You'll see for uh, East Jackson Middle School, we've got a document in there that talks about proposals and what we're doing there. And I will let you know that we have uh, gone through that process. We advertised for proposals on the middle school construction manager. We received those proposals, six of them on August 6th. We meet tomorrow morning for a first evaluation session. We meet next Tuesday for another one provide a short list for interviews, and those interviews are scheduled the following week of August 19. So that's the process we're using. It's a very similar one that we used for the high school construction manager. This is the same process, and we'll have scoring and then bring you a recommendation on that in September. Uh, to talk a little bit about the selection of the architect for Empower that John mentioned earlier, we have, uh, uh, we we received proposals on June 18th. We did our first evaluation session. We delayed it a bit because we were busy on East Middle. Uh, and we wanted John to get here, and he just just got here. So he's been serving on all of this with us. Um, our first evaluation on that uh, was July 29th. Our second was August 5th for short list. Invitations were issued actually this morning. And interviews are scheduled for September 4th. So. Lots going on in the processes of selecting architects and construction managers to bring <coughs> to board recommendations. Does anyone have questions on any of that? We're just trying to be sure we share more information and all that you might need to on these projects. No questions? Uh, the last thing I'd mention is we do have your, your monthly project report included that provides information on each project as it 
does on and some pictures as well so you can take a look at that and see some of the prog progress that we're making at the high school site it's really pretty exciting uh, and i think you'll enjoy that so if you have questions on anything as i said before let us know we'll be glad to go through any of it in depth or um, after the meeting Good. Before we before we move away from that, I do I do want to just thank the board for your support um, and your understanding of the process of how this all takes place. Um, we are very very fortunate in Jackson County to have some of the most premier leaders in the facilities and maintenance and operations that you could have in the state. And so um, lots of work, lots of effort, lots of planning has gone into all of this. Probably the greatest detail that we've ever attended to in Jackson County. So I'm I'm grateful for their leadership. I'm grateful for you um, trusting their judgment and appreciate the work that they've done tremendously. Transportation update. Mr. Yes. Uh, I want to first thank my transportation team. They worked very diligently uh, throughout the summer to make sure our first day uh, went well. And I'm proud to report that uh, we had a wonderful first day, and that is continuing. Times are uh, getting better on some uh, buses that um, everybody in the neighborhood decided that they would ride the second day of school. So, uh, <laughs> we are looking at those and addressing those. But we have had a great start and uh, continuing hiring people. Uh, we, we did lose some, as we talked about, the uh, day before the first day of school, uh, unfortunately, but that's okay wow. because we've got them uh, <laughs> training in the queue, and um, we hope to have two individuals start next Friday if everything continues on the process it's on. So um, we do need drivers. Um, that's a continuing need. We are continuing process, the hiring process, and the training process. So I am encouraged with that, and I appreciate all my drivers and what they've done in, you know, maintaining, um, getting the children home in a timely manner, safe manner, number one thing, but working when uh, you know, we, we are seeing increased ridership in some of our target schools that you know, we looked at and thought that would happen. Mm -hmm. and we will continue to uh, Train, hire train drivers to fill those needs. Yeah. But I'm very pleased with the way things are going and what's going on. I know that first day is always a challenge, you know, getting everybody home and within a timely manner. Has that in, in uh, decreased as far as the time that they're getting home since we've been doing it a few days, I'm yes, assuming? It's, it's getting better. Yeah. And, uh, I'm going to share this story with East Jackson on the today. And uh, one of the ladies in the office that handles the phones. She told me, she said, yeah, the first day was the first day, as expected. That's right. But yeah. Monday and Tuesday, I went in there and I asked about the radios because I thought something was wrong because they were um, quieter than what they you know, mm -hmm. were the second and third day of school. So I was very pleased to hear that. Exactly. I told her just took me into another zone and she might hear a little more. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, no, in saying that, uh, Miss Widow, yes, things are getting better. Good. Uh, times are improving. Yeah. West Jackson Middle School, talking to Ms. Fromm today. Uh, we've had two buses that um, were struggling to get there on time, and that time is improving. We continue to look for that trend uh, throughout the first week and into yeah. the second week. Of, yeah. Uh, well, do we still have some subs that are that are working full time, I guess, now? Yeah. I right. wish I could say we do, but any that we might have had are all in the house. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. To say that we, we right now have uh, drivers. Yeah. And we okay. Need more drivers than we need subs. Yeah. So that's kind of where we're at. How many do we need right now? How many new drivers well, do we need? We had, uh, obviously, we had, okay. we had five or six, and uh, we had three leave and two the, before the first day of school. And she we went. Some that are out that we're having to fill for. So uh, we need 10 to 15 just mm. to fill. Yeah. We have so that's that's where we're at. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. It's a continual process. Keep plugging along. Yeah. 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 I'd like to say something too. It's interesting on the on the operations side. We have an amazing team. Uh, the folks that really go the distance and there are challenges that haven't even necessarily been shared. They're they're ones that happen from time to time and this year in school nutrition and in transportation and even today with Josh at uh, we had lightning strikes at 
at schools and knocked out Jackson EMC transformers and mm -hmm. things happen, but it's, it's encouraging to see people who go the distance. There's people in the back that go the distance and do whatever it takes to make it happen. And, like the Gordon's truck with the cafeteria that's backed up at 11 o'clock the night before school starts because right. the Gordon's delivery service had an issue. Right. So those things Why? don't go unnoticed for sure. We can't always control what others, others do. No, that's we right. can't. Just, you know, the effort that people put in and what mm -hmm. is just amazing and encouraging. So yeah. my hat's off. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. Most right. definitely. So that is a lot and enough, but we okay. I do need like a five minute executive session um, for a, a, an issue I just need to update you on related to the legal okay. issue. So. All right. Do I have a motion that we go into an executive session at this time? Okay, in a second. All right. Very good. Thanks.